um, previous lectures were kind of giving a general introduction uh, to conformal field theory. The last lecture was kind of giving an abstract perspective on how the bootstrap algorithms work. And in this lecture, we're going to go into more detail, showing how they work in practice. And so the first hour roughly is going to be talking about the theory of implementing bootstrap algorithms um, using semi-definite programming. In the last 30 minutes, I'll actually show a demonstration uh, using my computer about how to use freely accessible software in order to create bootstrap plots yourself. And we'll actually show some plots that can be made in an hour or so on your computer. Um, OK. Um, so uh, we'll begin by kind of briefly reviewing uh, what we did in the previous lectures and also how it applies to this lecture. Um, so um, the content of the last lecture is we discussed these two bootstrap algorithms, one algorithm to constrain scaling dimensions that appear in the four-point function, and the other algorithm to constrain OB coefficients. And so all those algorithms consisted of the following ingredients. So first of all, there was a list of polynomial constraints. And so we're going to write this using slightly different notation in the previous lecture. I'll explain it in a moment. Um, so this P is some polynomial in delta. It's also a function of delta phi, but it's only a polynomial in delta. Um, um, so we imagine we have some polynomials which are labeled by L um, and uh, also M and N. They are polynomials in delta. They're also labeled by delta phi. And then you have functionals labeled by M and N, which act on the space of polynomials. And the claim is that the functionals contracted with these polynomials are uh, non-negative, uh, as long as delta satisfies some bound, which remember from the previous lecture is a bound that you, the user, choose. And a minimal bound is the unitarity bound. Um, so, so this numbers are derivatives. Of well, I, I, was, I was just about to explain. Yeah. So, 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 what, so what are these things? So as we discussed in the previous lecture, L was the spin. Uh, because, you know, recall that you, know, you have your four-point function, and it's written as the sum of OB coefficients labeled by delta and L. And then we have these blocks, delta and L. And then, as discussed in the previous lecture, uh, you start with an infinite vector space labeled by U and B, and you truncate it to some finite vector space, which is just a Taylor series around some special value of U and B. And so the derivatives in that Taylor series is what's labeled by M and N. So the derivatives in U are derivatives in B, or some alternative variables related to U and B. And so that's what the M and N labels are. L is just the spin, uh, where we include spins up to some finite cutoff. And so that's why L is some finite list. And then the functional is labeled by the derivative basis that we are choosing for this UB functional space. So, so these are the functionals. These are the polynomials. Um, the way we got polynomials in the scaling dimension delta, recall, is that these blocks, G, were originally written as um, you know, we described as something called some algebraic recursion relation, which allowed these things to be written basically as a sum of poles. Where this was, let's say, some function of eta. Um, and so now after taking derivatives in terms of u and b, u and b is just another way of writing r and eta. Um, so this just brings down various polynomials to delta. Um, and then um, when we write it in this way, we can also truncate this. So this is up to some r max. So then this is now r to the delta times a sum over a finite number of poles. So if you want to write this as a polynomial in delta, all you needed to do was multiply both sides by the product of poles, as well as um, for r to the minus delta. And so then, as long as you multiply both sides by this, then you will get a polynomial. Uh, but importantly, this quantity is positive, um, because delta, according to the unitarity bound, is always bigger than all the poles delta n. Similarly, this quantity is positive. And so for the bootstrap algorithm, the only thing we use is that the OP coefficient squared is positive. So if you multiply by some you know, positive quantity, it remains positive. Um, and that is how we were able to write the derivatives of this um, you know, block expansion as um, positive quantities times a polynomial. Um, and so, 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 that, so that's why this is the first uh, input to our algorithm. Um, so the second input to our algorithm. So can I just ask, I missed all those previous lectures yeah. in front of me, but uh, the justification for truncating this at our max is what? Oh, okay, good, okay. So, so I, I, I can briefly review that. So yeah, so, so, so just a, a, a lightning around the previous lectures that you have the four point function expanded as blocks. You have crossing symmetry, which means that this equation equals the same equation with B and U switched. And then, um, and then you were, you're setting up algorithms to take advantage of that crossing equation. There are various infinities you have to truncate. So the spins you need to truncate, the expression for how you compute the blocks you need to truncate, the U and B space you need to truncate. Um, and um, 
I think that's it. Um, and so uh, the truncation of the U and B space, that's okay, because that just means you're sampling some subset of constraints. And, and so it's rigorous just to look at a subset instead of looking at the whole function's working space. Um, truncating the expansion of the blocks as well as um, okay, so the expansion of the block, the reason why you can truncate it is basically this is a very quickly, it's an exponentially convergent expansion. Um, and so for the point of U and B that we expand around, so in terms of an R and eta variables, it ends up being R equals 3 minus 2 root 2. And this thing is a very small number, it's 0.17. The reason why you choose this special point is that this is equivalent to the value where U equals B. So there's some special value where U equals B, it's called the crossing symmetric point. In R and eta variables, that means R is an incredibly small number. And so when you're expanding an R, this is very small, and so this expansion R converges super quickly. And so that's why doing some truncation, say to R equals 20, is so good that like for numerical issues, it might as well be perfect. So, so, you, so you don't lose anything by doing that truncation. Um, and then um, the other truncation is the truncation on spin. And the reason why you're allowed to do that is because as proven in the previous lecture, if you look at this expansion, you can prove the tail of this expansion, including the OB coefficients, also drops off exponentially quickly. Um, as a power of r to some number, um, or that number in particular being delta. You know, so for really big delta, it's dropping off like r to the delta, r is a small number, so this is dropping off exponentially fast. So that's why the bootstrap is not sensitive to very huge dimension operators, it's not sensitive to huge spin operators, and that's why you are justified in doing that cutoff on spin. Um, okay, so, so hopefully this is equal to v is equal to one, one quarter. Uh, well, not, not, not quite, because like really it's like v equals z bar equals one half. Oh, sorry, you're right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this when they both equal one quarter. Yes. And then you write UB. Because the wise is to create a line. Yeah. To explain, not yeah. the point. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That, that, thanks for that correction. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of the first input to the algorithm is that you have some functional acting as some polynomial delta, and you're saying that's positive. Um, the second input to the algorithm, from as we discussed in the previous lecture, is that you you normalize the functional in a certain way. So this alpha m n um, would be normalized acting on, so just to write this out explicitly. So, you know, the, the, what are these p's? You know, they're basically derivatives of the crossed version of this block, where we defined in the previous lecture that f of u and v is basically g of u and v minus g of v u. So they will like delta and l, and then when you take derivatives um, in terms of z and z bar, which are just different ways of writing u and v. Uh, and so uh, we always had some kind of normalization. Um, and so uh, let's just call this like delta star and L star for the specific operator we're normalizing. And then of course, as usual, we set R to its special value and eta equals to one. And so depending on the algorithm, you normalize you know, a different operator. So for the scaling dimension algorithm, the operator you were normalizing was the identity. Um, and for the OP coefficient algorithm, the operator you were normalizing was the specific operator's OP coefficient you wanted to know. Um, and so you just have you know different cases for each different situation, but there's always there's always some normalization of the functional. Uh, and then finally, the third ingredient in these algorithms um, is that uh, there's a certain quantity that alpha is maximized. So again, you would have like alpha m n contracted with you know basically the same thing except labeled by a different delta star and l star, and then that would be the quantity which you want to maximize. So alpha acting on that quantity is being maximized. Um, and so as a reminder, for the OB coefficient algorithm, you were actually maximizing a quantity. So in particular, you were maximizing the functional acting on the crossing function of the identity. And then by extremizing that, that kind of gave you the best possible bound on the operator delta star L star, whose OP coefficient you were trying to maximize. Um, for the scaling dimension algorithm, as we discussed before, instead, you're just trying to see if a functional exists or not. And if the functional exists, then you get a contradiction, and so you, you get a, that point is disallowed. And if the functional does not exist, then you don't get a contradiction, and the point in principle can be allowed. Um, and so in that case, you're not actually extremizing any point. You know, it's, it's kind of like a trivial extremization, because you're just seeing if the functional exists or not. Um, so starting with this basically abstract rewriting of the algorithms we discussed in the previous lecture, we can now discuss how to actually implement this in practice using something called semi-definite programming. Where semi-definite programming is a way of taking into account polynomial constraints, you know, because that's the form of the constraints that we have, polynomials and delta, which are also bounded. So it's important that the, 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 the argument of the polynomial is bounded, which is always bounded, you know, at the very least by unitarity bounds, and you can also, as the user, choose to put in stricter bounds, you know, which is after all how you compute bounds, because you assume some strict bound, and you see if that leads to a contradiction. Um, okay, so before we go into the details of how this works, just any questions, you know, about the setup, 
um, you know, it's explained in the previous lecture, maybe, you know, it's a little more there. These coefficients alpha and n, are they supplied to the positive? Or? No, so the, the, these are functions. So the point is that, like, you have some vector space, which is these polynomials of delta, and then these are functionals acting on that vector space. And so, like, part of the algorithm is that the functional acting on this, that is then a number, which then has to be positive. But, I mean, otherwise, it's just a function. But, I mean, in the point number two, you are just, you know, taking derivatives of that guy and then multiplying by the coefficient. Right? Well, I mean, okay, but, like, I mean, th th this derivative thing is, like, another way of writing this P. I mean, like, this P itself was obtained by taking derivatives of the cross so like, so like, like this is kind of like the general p, and this is like a p for some specific l, okay. and, and, I, and some specific delta. So like, this is not a polynomial because you're normalizing. I mean, you can't normalize a polynomial to one. Um, you, you're normalizing a specific operator after taking derivatives, you know, to, to one, right. uh, and it's a different operator depending on the algorithm. Um, okay. So okay, great. So, so so let's discuss how to implement this. Um, and so we're going to do it in two steps. First, we're going to convert these ingredients into something called a polynomial matrix program, called a PMP. And then we're going to convert it to an SDP, it's called semi-definite programming. And then we're going to discuss how the software called SDPB actually solves that SDP. Um, so let's first start by writing this as a polynomial matrix program. Um, so the matrix, we call it M. We're going to give it two labels. We're going to discuss what these labels mean in a second. Uh, but for now, just think of them as abstract labels. So W goes from 1 to some capital W, J goes from 1 to some capital J. Uh, and then um, you have a matrix, a function of X, um, of polynomials. So some polynomial here, all of these things are labeled by W, all of them are labeled by J, and then you, we can also give it some label as it, for its entry in the matrix. You know, so this would be P, W, J, and then this would be like mj1 of x, etc. So, so, so this is like some you know arbitrary, let's say r by r matrix, all of whose entries are polynomials x, and we have a set of matrices labeled by j and w. Um, okay. Um, so um, the goal of a PMP, a polynomial matrix program, is to maximize um, the following quantity. So we have some vector for b is a vector whose size is w, so that's this big w here. Um, so we have b0 uh, plus, so w summed from 1 to the capital W, ew contracted with yw, um, where y is also an element of this w space. So it's also a vector of size w. So we're trying to maximize um, this uh, such that um, so now here we invoke these matrices. So we have some matrix, which I'll call M0, labeled by J, it's a function of X, plus uh, these Ys uh, contracted with the matrices, which remember labeled by W, and they also have this label J. And then we demand that this quantity, so this is a matrix, we demand that this quantity is positive definite. That's what this sign means. It's kind of a funny greater than equal sign. So this means positive definite for all x greater than or equal to zero and for j and for all j. So you know for j going from one to capital J. Um, okay, so let's explain how the notation here matches the notation there. Uh, because it's, it's just a rewrite. Um, so first of all, these y's, as labeled by w, these are basically our functionals, alpha m n. The only difference is that the y's are the functionals after you have taken into account the normalization condition. Um, because, so it's like you start with your alpha mn's, you, you get rid of one of them because of the normalization condition, and all the remaining free alphas, that's what we call y. And so, and so w is basically going through the space of alphas, and so in particular, um, w is basically the number of derivatives of the cross equation that you're looking at. Um, and so, so, so these y's are our functions. Um, okay, um, so, so that's what y is. Um, and then um, the fact that you had to do this normalization, that's basically what generates this constant matrix M0 of X and this constant B. Um, because like, like, you know, if you wouldn't have had a normalization, you would have just had this and that, but because you have a normalization, you know, it basically brings out a constant term. And so that, that's where B0 and M0 are coming from. Um, another thing is that I, I described the most general setup where this is a matrix of polynomials. And in the next lecture, we actually will use a matrix of polynomials once we do uh, many correlation functions. 
Uh, but here we're just doing the simplest context of just a single correlation function of scalars. And in that case, uh, we just have one entry. So it's, it's, it's not a matrix. So it's just literally a polynomial labeled by W and J of X. Um, in the next lecture, we'll discuss the more general case where it is actually a matrix. Um, so what are these labels referring to? Well, we just said W refers to MN. Uh, J just refers to L in this case. So J is just the spin. You know, it's, 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 just, it's just labeling, you know, the different polynomials of whom we act with the functional on. Um, so, so that's very simple. So J is just the spin. In the next lecture, we'll also talk about cases with multiple representations, and then J could be both the spin or the representation. Uh, but here it's just the spin. We just have one representation. Um, and then finally, X, which was, we demanded to be positive. So X is basically going to equal, you know, delta minus, you know, for given L, minus whatever the bound is. Because in our actual problem, in our actual problem, we have polynomials of delta, where delta is bigger than some delta B for every spin. Here, X is just bigger than zero, so we just find X to be delta shifted by delta B. You know, so such that this quantity is possible. So X also has a label J, because it depends on L. Well, I mean, you don't, but you don't need to give it a label because, like, I mean, you have a different polynomial for each j. Yeah, so, so I mean, yes, yeah, so you could say, like, x is defined differently for each polynomial. Yeah, so rho, you know, rows are different polynomials, right? Yeah, so the, the p's, these p's are different polynomials, oh, yeah. and for each p, x is shifted in, in a different way. Okay, so x, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, different, x is a different number. Well, it's a variable, and yeah, it's, it's a different, I think one variable is not enough, right? Well, I mean, like what? I mean, it, it's polynomial. So it's like you have many different polynomials. They're all a function of a variable which has to be positive. I think the question is, are they all a function of the same variable? Is it, are we just talking about one delta L? Or could there be multiple delta um, L? So no, so like these these shifts will be different. But that's OK, though, because like I mean, each polynomial is different. So yeah, so like, I mean, there's no sense of saying like, is this the same variable or not. I mean, it's just like you have different polynomials. And the, the claim is just that for every polynomial, you can always have a bound on its argument. Right, but in the context where there's multiple entries in this matrix, all the arguments of the polynomials, all the x's. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So if you had an actual matrix, so we're not going to discuss it in this lecture, but in the next lecture, in that case, indeed, all the entries in the matrix would have the same x because you'd all be shifting by, by, by the same, you know, for a given j. Okay, okay but, yeah, but, but we won't discuss that until the next lecture. Um, okay, so so I so hopefully that explains. Okay, so and so then it should be clear why this is the algorithm we're interested in, right? Um, because this constraint of the functionals, you know, contra contracted with the polynomials being positive, well, that's the same thing as this constraint here. Um, and then the, the goal, which is to maximize this quantity, this is just some B contracted with Y. Oh, so I should also explain what the Bs are. Um, and so the B, this is basically corresponds to this. So it's like whatever specific crossing function you're trying to maximize. Uh, and so in particular, in the case of the opaque coefficient algorithm, this would be the crossing function for some special operator you're looking at. And for the scaling dimension algorithm, it would just be a vector of zeros. Um, and so, 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 so B is the operator of interest. B is operator of interest that we're trying to maximize. Okay, so, so it should be clear that this is just a rewriting of that, just introducing some new notation. Sorry, what is an algorithm of positivity conditions that one was clear? Um, Okay, well, so um, the positivity condition is that this is, um, I guess, like a sum of matrices which are going to be positive semi definite. I mean, oh, so sorry, okay, so I, I, uh, sorry, let, 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 let me take a second back. So, um, as we discussed in the previous lecture, the way this algorithm works is that you look for a functional which satisfies these properties, and if you find it, then that would contradict the crossing equation. So, like, the algorithm itself does not involve lambdas. It's, it's, it's just the fact that if you could find such a functional, it would then contradict this equation. And in order to get a contradiction, it's crucial that you assume that the lambda squares are positive. But, like, but the lambdas themselves aren't entering into the algorithm, because after all, you're doing the algorithm kind of like operator by operator. Um, you know, in, in, so, so it's separate for every L. The, the, the algorithm, you know. Well, no, no. I mean, but you're doing the algorithem for, for, for many different values of spin. So the point but, is that okay, okay. it's like you're demanding, you're demanding positivity for every single spin up to your cutoff with these functionals. And then you're seeing if you can find such a functional, you know, with some normalization and such a delta satisfies certain bounds. But you need a functional which does it for all, all the same functional should do it for all the L's. Yes, yeah, the yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, the same functional must do it for all the L's. And, and as we discussed previously in the last lecture, 
you know, even though you put some cutoff in spin, in practice, if you find a functional that works, say, for spin up to, like, 50, you could also check that it will also work for every spin. So, like, you know, that's, that's not something you don't have to worry about. Um, I, oh. yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, because sure. I know you discussed this before, but just asking about that again. Yeah. I mean, the argument you gave earlier was that those terms are very small, so numerically it doesn't hurt you to neglect them. But if, but if there are a bunch of separate constraints for each L, then why does it matter if they're small? In other words, if they're small and negative, then that's not your problem. Sure. In principle, there would be a problem. I can just say in practice, just experimentally, if you have a functional which works for spins up to some cutoff, it always, like, as long as it's working for those spins, it will always end up working for the other spins. Um, and so, and, and so, I mean, because, like, so, so basically the way it works with the bootstrap is that, you know, first you choose um, your space of U and V. So you choose derivatives up to some order. And, like, that's going to be kind of, like, how, how constraining your bootstrap is going to be. And then in order to get that to work, you then just have to increase spin such that it works. But once it works, it's kind of discrete. Either it works or it doesn't. And so once the spins are big enough, it works. And making the spin bigger than that doesn't improve anything. You know, like it's not continuous. It's like either it works or it doesn't. And so like another way of saying that is that once you have found, you know, some functional, which is positive on, on like this big enough set of spins, that's like the good enough amount of spins, it is guaranteed. It's like, it's not, I can't prove to you mathematically, but I can say in practice, it always ends up being positive for all bigger spins. Um, now, why that had to be the case, I don't know of proof. And, and so I, I think that's an interesting question. I can just say it, it is the case. And some intuition of maybe why it's the case, you know, is the fact that like, you know, you've showed that this functional is positive for like the vast majority of the four point function. And so that's why it also ends up being positive even for the small tail. But I, I agree that's not like, you know, on a direct implication. Um, okay. Um, so I, any, any further questions? Okay, so, so now let's further um, rewrite this again. Like, what is B and why are you trying to maximize that? B, B is just the specific crossing function you're maximizing. So, so this was step two. Because remember, you, you always normalize the functional. Um, or sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, no, sorry, that, sorry that, 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 that's step three. Um, so step three was that you maximized the functional uh, acting on a specific crossing function. And so remember in the OP coefficient algorithm, that was the identity crossing function. And in the scaling dimension algorithm, that was basically zero. Because in the scaling dimension algorithm, you're just trying to see if the functional exists. You're not maximizing anything. So in the scaling dimension, so let's talk about just the scaling dimension algorithm. Yeah. What would we be? Zero. Scaling? It would so be a the, vector of zeros. So you're not maximizing anything. Yeah. Big yeah. So, 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 so it's, it's kind of like a trivial example of maximizing. So in the scaling dimension algorithm, you just want to literally know, does the functional satisfying these constraints exist or not? So it's not there, I mean, it's not like a method. No, not a well, I mean, I mean, it's an example of this algorithm. It's just, it's just a simpler version because basically you're just, you're just trying to see like, does any, you know, for any, like, uh, like, is there any functional which satisfies this positive semi-definite okay. condition? It's with no big coefficient algorithm that, in addition, not only does that have to satisfy this, but also you want to then maximize, you know, this b, you know, which in that case will be, um, you know, the functional acting on the identity. Um, so that's why it's discussed in the previous lecture. The OP coefficient algorithm usually requires a bit more, you know, numerical precision because you're trying to do more with it. Um, okay. Um, so so now let's move on to how to write this as a semi-definite program. Um, so this is what's called an SDP. Um, and so the idea of a semi-definite programming program is that instead of the constraints being matrices of polynomials or just one polynomial, instead it just becomes a matrix which is not a polynomial. And so there's a basic theorem we use, which I won't prove, which is that um, any positive semi-definite matrix of polynomials uh, of x, where x is greater than or equal to zero, so like you know any m of x uh, can be written using some basis of matrices, which are called a of x, uh, contracted with a constant matrix y. Um, and so th this is just some like you know linear algebra thing where it's like you basically just choose some special set of points such that you can always write some constant matrix in terms of a matrix uh, polynomials of the type that it's positive semi-definite over x greater than or equal to zero. So, so this is just some mathematical thing that, that, that you can prove. I won't go into the details. Uh, but we then use this fact basically to rewrite the PMP as a pair of SDPs. So we're going to introduce two programs which are dual to each other. And we first introduce the dual one. So one thing which is actually kind of funny is that the dual program is the one that's most directly similar. And it's the primal, which is the dual of the dual, which is the one that's a little bit you know, funkier. Um, OK, so we first introduce the dual program. So in this case, we again are maximizing a quantity. So b0, it's the same b0 as before. So this first line is basically the same. 
It's, I mean, it, it is literally the same. So we are maximizing our functional, contracted with this B, um, where, as usual, Y is the specter of Ws. But we're also going to be maximizing it over a matrix capital Y. Um, and uh, such that, um, so now, here things are going to look, look a little bit different. So I'll explain what this notation means in a moment. Um, such that this constant matrix Y is positive semi definite um, Okay, so, so let's unpack what this all means. Um, so these A's are some basis of matrices, which are used in this proof where you rewrite a matrix of polynomials as uh, some constant matrix times a basis. So, so, so that's what this A is. There is some conditional so this constant matrix, right? Uh, well, I mean, th 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 this, this is just a quantity you, you can compute ma 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 mathematically. This, this well, is a theorem that if you have... Uh, you, you, yeah, you, you, you can only do this if x squared equals zero, and that's... Well, that but that I can choose, so instead of y minus y... Sorry? Instead of matrix y, yes. I can choose matrix minus y. In principle, and then th there would be a, a different a. Uh, but, but, I mean, but you wouldn't want to do that, because ultimately we want, so y, we want y to be positive semi right, So a is fixed. Well, yeah, I mean, A is fixed depending on what. So the point is that we are writing, we're writing a matrix of polynomials in terms of a matrix of just numbers. And we're using this basis, this basis of matrices A. And we are, and we are doing that such that we want the matrix to be positive semi-definite. So that's why, you know, you wouldn't choose minus Y if Y is one that's positive semi-definite, because then minus Y would not be positive semi-definite. Okay. And so the way we do that is, um, so like the way this matrix, this is a matrix of symmetric polynomials A of X. And uh, the way we, re we do this rewriting is that you evaluate this matrix at some points X, K, um, where, and, and this allows you uh, to relate this constant matrix Y basically to some combination of these matrices M evaluated at X, K for a whole bunch of points X, K, as well as the functional little Y. Um, so, so, so this big Y, it depends on little y, as well as the matrix of polynomials evaluated a whole bunch of different points. Um, that, that is what big Y is, and there is just a mathematical way of doing that rewriting, which I won't go into detail for. Um, but uh, other than that, the B's here are the same B's there. The functional Y is the same functional there. Um, and uh, this P is the same polynomial there. R, S is just the labels of the matrix of polynomials. Um, so in our simple case, we just don't have a matrix. So R and S are just both B1. J is the same label there. It's just going through all you know, the various spins. Um, and so, um, so hopefully it should be clear how this is equivalent to that. You know, because the first line is the same. We're maximizing this quantity. And then the constraint that this thing be semi-definite is just equivalent to the constraint that um, this Y be the semi-definite, where Y is now a constant matrix instead of a matrix of polynomials. Um, okay, so, and so this is what's called the dual semi-definite program. Um, but for semi-definite programs, it turns out that there is a primal version of this problem. So this is basically another program, which under certain conditions is equivalent to the dual program. And so the, the, the dual version, which is actually called primal, it's the dual of the dual. So here you minimize um, okay, so like you'll see in a second why it's like the dual, because like you basically consider a dual functional, uh, as should be clear in a moment. Okay, so here we sum over J, R, S, K, um, uh, J, R, S, this thing evaluated at these points, X, K, and then we're introducing this dual functional, Y tilde. And so you can already see that this dual functional, um, you know, which is an element of this dual space, it's basically all the other variables here. So, you know, instead of Y being labeled by W, now the dual functional is labeled by R, J, R, S, and K. Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, like the, the dual functional in, the, in this vector space. Um, similarly, we define a dual capital Y, uh, J, R, S, K, um, which is evaluated as follows. So, we had this, these matrices A, which allowed us to write 
um, the M's in terms of the capital Y's. And so now, this capital Y is, is related to this little Y tilde. J R S K. And so we now minimize this quantity such that um, the sum over J R S K of our polynomials evaluated at these points contracted with the dual uh, functional equals minus B dot. And such that this dual matrix is positive semi -double. Um Okay, so um, I'm going to now explain in a moment under what conditions this program is equivalent to this program. So it's the first program which is kind of intuitively related to the program we want to solve. Hopefully I explained that in a clear way. And the relation of this program, it's not so clear, but I will show you in a moment that mathematically it's equivalent to this program. Um, so like the intuitively clear program is this one, and this is just some like program which applies to the dual functional, which acts on like the dual, you know, variables uh, with some dual matrix asking that that be positive. Um, okay. Um, so now these two programs are not in general equivalent. They're only, they're only equivalent like under certain conditions. Um, and so the way we solve these programs is using something called SDPB. Which was developed by David Simmons Duffin, um, but like I mean, semi semi definite program solvers have existed you know for decades. You know, STPB is just a particularly good one for our purposes. You know, but like you know, he didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. So STPB is something that solves SDPs, and the way it solves it is that okay. So what 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 are the entries to our program? So the things the user specifies are the polynomials p as well as b, which is the thing you want to extremize. So that's so that's the things you the user put in. Um, the thing which the program then tries to determine are these y's. Um, so you start with some initial y's. Um, so you have some set y, y tilde, capital Y, capital Y tilde. And so, so we start with some initial set, let's call it zero. Um, and then the program basically, um, starting from this initial point, it tries to decrease, it basically tries to satisfy these constraints. Um, and so in particular, let's define how far away we are from satisfying the constraints in this program. So let's define this deviation, and we have one for every w. So this is like the first primal uh, deviation. And so this is just going to be um, the first constraint we're trying to satisfy, um, which is uh, this one. Um, so let me just write this in some kind of compact notation, because we already wrote it over there. So it's basically it's p combined with y tilde plus b. Because if this is satisfied, then this constraint is satisfied. And so this is basically the deviation to what extent you haven't satisfied that, that constraint. So this is our first deviation. Our second deviation is going to be the other constraint you're trying to satisfy, which is this constraint. Um, so let's also write that in some compact notation. So this is y tilde minus the sum over a y tilde. Um, and then for the dual problem, there's just one um, constraint you were trying to satisfy, which is this one. Um, so let's define our last deviation. Um, this deviation is labeled by J, R, S, and K instead set of W, because for the dual problem. And so this is just defined you know, as the extent to which you have not satisfied this constraint. Um, and so just writing this in this concise notation again. Um, minus trace of a y. So if all these deviations are zero, then you have exactly uh, saturated those constraints. And what STPB is doing is that it's, it's basically looking for some values of little y, little y tilde, big y, big y tilde, such that these deviations are as small as possible, you know, because you want to satisfy these programs. Um, at the same time, because of course, these programs are not just trying to satisfy these constraints, they're also trying to either maximize this quantity or minimize that. And so the program is trying to do two things. It's trying to satisfy the constraints, and it's also trying to extremize these specific quantities. And so this is what's called uh, the objectives. So there's the dual objective, which is just the quantity we're trying to um, um, maximize in the dual problem. So just to rewrite it, remember that was BW contracted with YW. And then there is the primal objective, which is the quantity we're trying to minimize in the case of the primal problem. 
um, J R S K S K Y tilde. Okay. Um, so this is what the program is trying to do, subject to the condition that Y is positive semi-definite and Y tilde is positive this is semi -definite. So this is what STBB is trying to do. So it's trying to make these deviations small, subject to these conditions, and then it's also trying to extremize these two quantities, starting at some specific point uh, which the user specifies. Sorry. Yes. Just to clarify, you only run one of the two, or you do run both? No, you do simultaneously. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's an important point. And then this is something which is a bit maybe unexpected, is that it turns out that like for this set of optimization problems, there's like a primary and dual version of it, corresponding basically to the functional and like the dual of the functional. Because you, like you have like a functional acting on a vector space, you always have the dual of a functional acting on a vector space, and you're basically trying to solve programs applying to both of those at the same time. But originally, you only had one problem that you were trying to solve. Yeah, we have one problem we are trying to solve, which is just rewritten as this problem. Then by, but, by but, you have two, you well, know. I mean, we, the reason why you have two is that, I mean, this is just the way mathematically you solve like semi-definite programs, is that, is that there's always the, the original version and the dual version. And the point is that these two things become equivalent um, as, you know, uh, in a certain limit, which I'm about to say. And so that's why the most efficient way of solving this program is to solve both at the same time. Um, and so you, that's why you start with like y big y, y tilde big y tilde, and then you try to satisfy, satisfy all these things at the same time. Um, now, as I'll explain in a moment, there's some cases where you can basically show that if one can't be satisfied, the other one can't be satisfied either. But it's just most efficient to try to do both simultaneously. In the case of scaling dimension, very good, right? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, like, the, the point is that like when you start with your arbitrary point, they don't start as equivalent. They only become equivalent. No, no, I'm talking about when you're trying to compute the scaling dimensions, not only yeah. B is just zero. So then, no, I mean, B is zero, but you still have two programs. You still have the primal program and the dual program. I mean, I mean, look, B, B appears so in Y. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, you're always trying to solve, solve both. Um, and so, you go about, you know, trying try, try to satisfy these conditions. Um, and l l let's say we get to a point, okay, so if these deviations are smaller than a certain user specified value, like if, if they're smaller than a certain threshold, um, then you could say that um, your problem is feasible. So, so if, if these deviations become small enough, like these are the various errors um, with the user specified, you know, cutoff, then you say the problem has become feasible. And so once you find values of these little y's and big y's, such that these deviations are small enough, then you can prove that the difference between these objective functions is non-negative. So you can show that like dual objective minus primal objective is greater or equal to zero. Um, and like this basically just follows from these definitions and the fact that y and capital Y tilde are both positive semi -definite. I mean, basically the way this proof works is that you, you can rewrite this thing once the, once this problem is feasible. So once these conditions are satisfied, you can show that the difference between these two things boils down to trace y y tilde, uh, which is then greater than or equal to zero because these two things are positive semi -definite. Um Okay, um, and so once both the primal and dual problem are both feasible, i.e. these deviations are very small, then because this quantity is strictly positive, we can then just try to make the difference between dual objective and primal objective as small as possible. So that's the second step of the STBB, is that it tries to make this quantity basically equal to that quantity. Because after all, remember, in one case you're minimizing it, in another case you're maximizing it. So they can kind of like meet in the middle. Um, and so then we define a new quant variable. So you see like the difference of this is something which is you know, defined to be what we call duality gap. This is the extent to which the primal problem and the dual problem are different. And then once this thing becomes smaller than some threshold, then we say that it's optimal. So, so if this thing is smaller than a certain threshold, which you, which you the user, specify, then you say optimal. So basically to summarize, the way, the, the way STPB works is that it starts with these y's, and there's two steps. First of all, the question is, like, is it feasible? And then if it's feasible, then you ask the question of, can you make it optimal? And so feasible just means you're approximately sat satisfying these constraints. Optimal means that really the primal and dual problem become exactly the same. And, and, and so it can end in two ways. Either you can just show that it's not feasible, and then certainly it's not going to be optimal. Or you can show that, oh, it's both feasible, and in fact, it's also optimal. Um, and so basically, 
each of those you know, possibilities applies to the two algorithms we are interested in in practice. Um, so you know, uh, in particular, for the scaling dimension algorithm, we just want to know if the functional exists. So basically, we just want to know if it's feasible or not. And like, because we're not trying to maximize anything in the scaling dimension algorithm. For the OP coefficient algorithm, we actually are trying to you know, maximize a certain quantity. And so that's why we're looking for an optimal solution. So we expect that the problem will be feasible, and furthermore, it will be optimal. And then we will try to you know, basically make it as optimal as possible, and that will give us the best possible bound on our OB coefficient. So it is wise. There are supposed to be functions acting on something on the right? Wise? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, the, the, the little wise are. The little wise, yeah. Yeah, the little wise, yeah. So the little wise are. The big wise are basically a rewriting of the derivatives of the crossing functions. Um, OK. So, and so, so, so that's how the program works. And like, that's why the scaling dimension algorithm is easier because you only have to basically do step one. It's for the OB coefficient algorithm. So like, this is what you do for scaling dimension algorithm. For OB coefficient algorithm, you additionally also want to do step two of actually you know, finding an optimal solution. Um, OK. Um, so now, um, let's see how we're doing on time. Um, ah, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, OK, so now we can describe how to actually use this in practice. Um, and so for that, I will switch to my computer uh, to talk about this implementation. Um, and so I'm going to demonstrate the scaling dimension algorithm as well as the OP coefficient algorithm in the simplest possible situation, which was the four-point function of identical scalars. Um, which is um, you know, the only case we've been considering so far. You know, in the next lecture, we're going to do uh, mixed correlators as well as theories with a more interesting uh, global symmetry. OK, so let me share my screen. Um, great. Um, OK, so the first thing I'm going to describe, um, and I'll try to go through this slowly. So I have this very simple code, um, which is available on the lecture notes. And so like people have been getting the lecture notes and the emails. Yeah. Okay, I will make it full screen. In fact, I will even make it 150%. Is, is, is this, is this a visible now? Yeah. Um, okay, let me just scroll up to wherever we want to be. Um, so um, so there's, a, there's a code uh, called bootstrap.m, which is available on the lecture notes on the archive. So you just download the source and you can access this wrapper code. And so this is very nice because this way you don't have to write the code from scratch. The purpose of this code, this is just creating an input which SCPP will process. So this isn't doing SCPP itself. It's just a Mathematica wrapper file. That's why you can use Mathematica. You don't have to use some fancy C++. And so basically, you as a bootstrapper would write a different wrapper for every bootstrap problem you want to do. And so here, I'm going to demonstrate the simplest bootstrap problem, which is just four-point function of identical scalars. And then you know, once you know to bootstrap, you can do more interesting stuff. Um, and so let me explain exactly how the ingredients we've discussed are in this code. Um, so first of all, we have this CB poles, and this is just saying that um, for a uh, given uh, block, remember you write the, like a conformal block as a sum over you know, poles and delta, and then you want to turn it into a polynomial by multiplying by the product of poles. And so this is just telling you what are those poles for a block of a given spin, assuming that we're only you know, going up to a certain R max. Uh, and then nu is basically the space time dimension. It's, it's a d minus 2 over 2. Um, OK. Um, and so in particular, the factor which we multiply the conformal blocks by such that we get a polynomial is this factor. And so this factor, which is you know, defined in some setup above, it's basically the list of poles, because you're multiplying by a product of poles. And then also, remember, you have to divide by 4r to the delta. And so this cb prefactor is just going to be the thing you multiply the conformal block by, such it becomes a polynomial. OK. And so now, remember from our algorithms that we have a whole bunch of constraints. So we have conformal blocks of many different spins, and we're saying that the functional acting on those conformal blocks has to be positive. So this v is the list of those constraints. So as you see, it's a table for all the spins we're looking at. So we're going to be looking at spins up to some cutoff. Um, so that's what our list of spins are. As explained in the first lecture, for identical four-point functions, the spins have to be even. This is something which just follows from a simple crossing constraint. And so we have basically, so this f is just derivatives of blocks. So the f function is defined here. And basically, it just takes these derivatives of blocks, which can be pre-computed um, using a code called scalar blocks, which just implements the zomological recursion relations. Um, and so we described in detail how those works, but there's some code that does it for you. And so it takes those derivatives of blocks, and then you have a different derivative of blocks for every spin. 
And so this is the set of your polynomial constraints. So you have one for every spin, and then this f is just uh, a list of derivatives of the conformal blocks, and then multiplied by a positive quantity such that it's a polynomial in delta. Um, okay, so, so, so that's what v is. It's a table of polynomials in delta, which should particularly rewrite as polynomials in x, where x is just delta minus unitary. Okay. Um, in this case, you're not supposed to find the alpha, right? Because... Well, okay, so I'm, we're, we're not running the code yet. We're just doing the input. So, okay. so like, for the input, you, you just want to write input, which is your list of polynomial constraints. So all this wrapper file is doing is basically writing down three things. The list of polynomial constraints, the thing you're going to normalize to one, and the thing you're going to maximize. Because sure. remember, saying, those are the three inputs to the output. In this case, if you fix delta bound to the unitarity, yes. you're not supposed to find the uh, the Indeed, bond. yes. Okay. So yeah, if delta, if the bounds for every spin were just unitarity, then we expect there should be such a CFT with such, you know, bounds, and thus you shouldn't be able to find a functional. Because if you found a functional, that would give a contradiction, and then I would say it's a disallowed. So have we inputted alpha yet? No, no, no. no. There, there is no alpha. I mean, the, the, this, is just, again, this, is just, this is just the list of constraints, the quantity you're normalized to one, as well as the thing you're going to extremize. So V is the list of constraints. Contain alpha. Sorry? Constraints contain alpha. Because, you know, um, no, so, okay, okay. Well, when I say polynomial constraint, I just mean literally the polynomials of which alpha is acting on. Okay. Yeah, so it's like M in this language, okay. P in that language, you know, which was labeled by the spins. So V is the list of these polynomial constraints of which alpha will act on. Um, uh, next, there is the quantity you want to normalize to one. So in the scaling dimension algorithm, which we're looking at, that's just the unit operator. And so this unit vec, this is just the derivatives of the conformal block of the unit operator, but the conformal block of the unit operator is just one uh, because it's just trivial. And, and so that's why this is like a list of very simple numbers. I mean, it's not exactly one because you also have to multiply by u to the delta phi. Because uh, in the crossing equations, remember, it's like u to the delta phi multiplying the conformal block. So that's why it's not literally zero. Instead, it's derivatives of u to the delta phi. And so this is a, a very simple quantity. Like that's what's given here. Lastly, there's the quantity we want to normalize. And so remember, for the scaling dimension algorithm, sorry, you want to extremize. Remember, for the scaling dimension algorithm, you're not extremizing anything. So just a vector of zeros. But it has, to be, it has to be a vector of the right size. And so that's why the quantity we're extremizing is literally just a vector of zeros given by zero norm. Um, so as you see, this, this code is very simple. There's just three ingredients. There's the list of polynomials, which are our constraints. There's the quantity we are extremizing, which is zeros. And there's the quantity we're normalizing, which is just the unit operator crossing function. And so this uh, function, right bootstrap SDB, it takes these three inputs, the polynomial constraints, the thing we're normalizing, and the quantity we're extremizing, and it uses some code upstairs that you could just think of some black box code, so you don't have to go into details. But basically what this code is doing is that it's basically putting it in a format such that SDPB can run. Um, and so basically, it's, it's basically waiting. The, uh, so like, okay, what's this doing in practice? So, I mean, I mentioned there's some steps I didn't show in full detail, how like given some polynomials, you write it as a matrix. And there's some kind of symmetric matrices A, which allow you to write that as a matrix. So that's what the code upstairs is doing. So it's taking these like polynomials and it's writing them as a big matrix using some good uh, basis matrix A. Um, you but, specify the maximum M plus N you want. Yes, yes, so yes. So, so here, like you've specified how many derivatives you want to include. I mean, this is what we call N max. And then L's is like what spins you're going to Order is like when you're expanding the blocks up to what R max you're going to. Um, and then uh, kept pole order is something we discussed in the previous lecture. That's how when you're computing blocks, you want to have as few poles as possible. And so this is basically how many poles you keep. And then, and then these um, are basically your choice of bounds. Because remember, the way the algorithm works is that for every spin, you choose unitarity, except for one spin, you, you do a more generous bound. And then you see, is that allowed or not? And that's how you get upper bounds in the space of scaling division. Um, okay, so, so this is the code for the scaling dimension. Um, and before I run it, I'll also show you the code for the OP coefficient algorithm because it's very similar. So the OP coefficient algorithm here, um, so again, the polynomial constraints are exactly the same because that step in the algorithm is identical. The only difference is that now the quantity you're normalizing is not the unit operator. Instead, it's whatever operator you want to, you know, bound its OP coefficient. So in this specific code, we're choosing the stress tensor operator because every local CFT is guaranteed to have a stress tensor, as we discussed in the previous lectures. So that's a good operator to, to bound its OP coefficient. And so here, this is basically just the crossing function of the stress tensor where we put in some convenient normalization factor. And so basically, this is just F applied to spin 2, which is the stress tensor. 
Um, and then we set the scaling dimension to be three. And so, so that, that, that's, that's what this setting x equal to three minus blah, blah, blah is. Okay, so the thing we're normalizing is the stress tensor crossing function. And then the thing we're extremizing, you know, as we've discussed, is the unit operator. Because the idea is that, you know, by extremizing the unit operator, that gives a bound on the OP coefficient of the stress tensor operator. Um, okay, so, and so the, the code is very similar to the code of the uh, scaling dimension. There. So all we do here is now we choose specific values of the gap um, as well as how many spins and how many derivatives and like how well we're approximating the block. And then this is going to create the input. So for instance, here in this line, um, this 0.52 is the value of delta phi we're going to choose. So remember, delta phi is the scaling dimension of the external operators. And so we're going to choose 0.52. The reason why I'm choosing 0.52, you'll see in a moment, is because like, turns out that's approximately where the IC model lives. But like, for now, it's just a value. I mean, it's above the unitarity, which is a half. We're working in three dimensions, so that's okay. So we're choosing 0.52. And then we're going to choose the gap for every single spin to be unitarity, except for spin zero, at which we're going to choose it to be 1.4. And then I'm going to run the exact same code, except also choosing it to be 1.5. And the reason is that, I mean, I can just tell you, spoiler alert, it will turn out that 1.4 is in the allowed region, 1.5 is in the disallowed region. And so in one case, they're going to find a functional, in another case, you're not going to find a functional. Um, the next, this next parameter you can ignore, um, the six is basically how many derivatives you're choosing. So six is a very modest number. So this will just take a split second to run. Um, 10 is how many spins you choose. So as you see, you, you, don't, you really don't need that many spins. Like, you know, like this will already give a pretty good bound and we're only choosing 10 spins. Um, um, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. The, the range, this was the spins. So we're choosing up to 15 spins. 10 was how many poles we keep. Um, and then finally, this 40 is basically when you're expanding the blocks in R, it's like how many orders in R. So this is the R max. Um, okay. so. So what is the 1.4 and 1.6 one? So the 1.4 versus 1.6 is the uh, gap we assume on the spin zero sector. Because remember, like the way the algorithms work is that we assumed a certain bound on every spin. And so like you can choose the bound of unitarity except for one spin for which you choose something different. And then you see if that different bound is allowed. And th that's how you get upper bounds. Because like if the bound is too big, it'll be disallowed. But if it's officially small, it'll be allowed. Uh, okay. And, and this uh, I think I think think will find will tell you whether there is a this polynomial or not. Well, and it, 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 it not. will say whether our bound assumptions are consistent with conformal symmetry or not. Because basically, if we find a functional, then that contradicts the crossing equations. Thus, that assumption was wrong. If we don't find a functional, then it doesn't contradict anything, and the point is in principle allowed. And so, so that's so that's how the algorithm is working. So we're seeing like is one point four allowed or not? Is one point five allowed? Or not? In, this, in the first entrance, you can like play whatever number you yeah. want. Yeah, so the first, the first entrance, like our x-axis, is just the value of delta phi. You know, so it's like delta phi is the scaling dimension of like, you know, the lowest dimension z2 odd operator. And then this 1.4, 1.5 is the scaling dimension of the lowest dimension z2 even operator. Um, and so, and so th this is creating input for any z2 invariant c of t. Like, this, we're not using, we're not specifying the IC model. I mean, it turns out the bounds will be relevant to the IC model. But, you know, it applies to any z2 invariant c. Um, okay, so here I just, I, I run this. Okay, sorry, but before I run this, um, first I have to create the derivatives of the blocks. Um, and so I just wanted to demonstrate everything to show that you can do everything kind of on your computer in not so much time. Um, so there's this thing called Docker, which in the lecture notes, it explains how to download it. It's a freely available software. And Docker basically is some cloud, which includes a bunch of bootstrap code on it. And so this allows you to run the bootstrap on your laptop instead of having to use a cluster. So this, this one makes it very accessible to beginners. So Docker is some cloud software. And so Docker includes a program called Scalar Blocks, which is a program which implements the Zomological recursion relations. And so this is just going to create derivatives of conformal blocks um, you know, for various spins in a, in a specific space-time dimension. So here I'm just running Scalar Blocks in space-time dimension 3 you know, with R expanded up to 40, derivatives up to 6, spins from 0 to 21, poles up to 10. Um, and then you can ignore these parameters for now. Uh, and then, yeah, and then with precision 665 in binary. Um, and so I run this and it just creates a bunch of blocks uh, on my desktop. So here I just created all these blocks. So, so, so these are all derivatives of blocks. Uh, and as you see, it took like literally a split second to create them. So, you know, this is very quick. Um, okay, so, so, let's, so let's put them in the file I want to choose. So now, uh, so now that I've created these blocks, that means I can now run uh, this code which uses these derivatives of the blocks. Um, okay, so now I run this code 
And now it creates an input file in my folder called test 14 XML. So this is going to be the input file for this, you know, identical four point function bootstrap bound where I assumed a bound of 1.4 in the spin zero sector and unitarity for everything else. Let me create a similar input file where I assume the bound of 1.5. And then finally, let me create one last file um, where I'm going to look at, um, I'm going to try to get a bound on the OP coefficient of the stress tensor. So here I run the different input file, icing CT. Um, and here again, I look at 0.52. Um, but here, you know, I, I just assume unitarity for everything. All right, so this is going to create the other input file. So I now have three input files. Um, next, um, the next step you have to do is that in order for STPB to run, you have to convert these XML files to some other kind of file. Um, and so th this is kind of like a technical step, so, but there's a program which does it for you. It's not so important. It's called PVM to STB. Basically, like you need to write it as a PVM type input file. Um, okay, so, 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 let's, so let's convert our three different files to, um, uh, to, to PVMs. Okay, so let's do it for uh, test 15. So that takes a second. Let's do it for test 14. It also takes a second. Uh, and then finally, let's do it for OP coefficient guy, um, which was uh, test CT. Okay, so now you can see on our desktop, instead of these XML files, you now have these folders called input CT, input 14, input 15. And these folders basically consist of a bunch of inputs that SVP knows how to interpret. So, I mean, this isn't so important, but like, what, what are these files? So these files are the objective function you're extremizing, and then it's a bunch of matrices, you know, written in some very compact notation. Um, okay, so now we are actually ready to run STBB. Um, and so uh, let's go ahead and run it. Um, so let's first run it uh, for the point um, where we assume the gap was 1.4. Um, so, okay, so here we're going to run where we assume the gap was 1.4. And so, okay, one last thing I should specify is that, remember when I was describing the algorithm, I said how there's various parameters that the user specifies. So here we have this parameter file. And so before we run it, let's just look through the parameter file to see how we've specified these parameters. So for instance, um, because we're just trying to see if the functional exists or not, that means we only care about feasibility. And so SCPB has a capability of seeing if the problem is feasible and then not bothering to check if it's optimal. And if you're just trying to, if you're just trying to do the scaling mention algorithm, you might as well do that because it's quicker. And so that's why we turn on this, this thing called find, detect primal feasible jump or find dual feasible or detect dual feasible jump. And this basically tells the code to stop if, if it finds that it's either dual feasible or primal feasible and not try to find that it's optimal because it's not necessary. Uh, there's also the precision. So it turns out that for the bootstrap to run, you have to use very high precision. This is precision in binary. And so it's kind of like surprisingly big. You know, like if you're a programmer, you should be surprised to see, you know, requirements of precision of 700. Turns out to be the case. What does it mean in binary? Two to the minus 700? Yeah, so yeah, it's basically like instead of in, in 10, it's, you know, like two. Uh, so, it's, so it's like log base two instead of log base 10. So it's still, it's a pretty huge number. Yeah, it's a huge number, yeah. Um, I mean, you, I guess you basically divide this thing by log two. Um, and and, and, and that's, that's the number of digits. Is it two to the minus seven seven? seven no, 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 no. It's, no, it's, it's not two to that power. It's uh, it's like that number of bits in in binary. Okay, so you have to yeah. it. But still, it's basically one over two to the power of seven seventy six. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's never the power of seven seventy six. It's basically, I think it's seven seventy six to just divided by log two. No, no, it's like it means that we have to have so many bits to distinguish. Yes, yes. So, so this is seven seventy six bits, but that means that the number is one. Yeah. Over two is part of seven seventy six. Yeah. Uh, no, it it should because be because if you assume that you have three bits precision, yeah. it means you know up to one eight. Yeah. Four sure. bits, one over to sixteen. Okay, uh, sure. Um, anyways, yeah. So yeah, you 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 have to have you have to have a big amount of precision. Um, so th but this is just this is okay. Basically, the reason why is that in STPB there's something called like you have these huge matrices of like you know the, the matrices are gonna be very big. You know these constant matrices, and you have to be inverting these matrices, and you have to do it at a very high precision. And, and so, that, and so, like, if you have a huge matrix and you're inverting it, that requires a lot of precision. Awesome, um, yeah, I'm still confused what these alphas really are. You're saying they're functions, but I don't. They're functionals. They're functionals, sure. Yes. But like, and so we're in seeing the program, like, it's gonna, you know, it's trying to find a functional. So it's but, like, but what type, what, what functions does it try? You know, like, what are the examples? No, I mean, it's a linear function. Wow. It's it's so I mean, it's a linear function. So it's it's literally just 
I mean, with stuff we wrote on the board before. So alpha is linear functional, it's labeled by two variables, M and N, and it's acting on the on these polynomial constraints. And it's just seeing it's like, is there any functional you can write down such that it satisfies these constraints? You're not looking at the space of all functions. You're looking at linear functionals. So it's just like some It's like a list of numbers, that. basically. Yeah, exactly. You're looking for a list of numbers. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so then this is the number of cores you're using, and then um, they're what we call these threshold values. So, so these values basically are when you tell the program that you found a feasible point. And so this is something you have to play with, but it turns out like, you know, these, like, these are kind of good guesses. Um, we, the duality gap we're not really using so far because we're not doing an optimal problem. And then the other parameters are parameters you can basically just leave as what they are. I mean, these are other inputs which aren't so important. So um, the difference between primal and dual is that, you know, in one case you're summing over M and N, the derivatives, and in the other case you're summing over the spins. Is that right? The spins as well as K, which is like, you have to evaluate the matrix at various values in order to go from the matrix of polynomials. Oh, again, sorry. So well, you start with the matrix of polynomials. Yes. And then you're writing that as a, matrix, a constant matrix. And so to go from one to the other, you basically have to evaluate the matrix of polynomials at many different points, K. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's like that list of points you have to do about. So like it's, it's basically a way of kind of like, you know, saying how a polynomial is written as a non-polynomial. Um, okay, um, anyways, so, so let's run uh, the program, um, assuming, this, this, uh, um, assuming this gap of 1.4. Uh, and so you see it runs very quickly. So it only took 11 steps. So what happened? Basically, the dual objective is always zero because we're not extremizing anything. And so the only thing was the primal objective. The primal objective, it starts with some big value and it was getting bigger and bigger. And so the program ended after 10 steps, basically because SCBB detected that, it, that the problem is never gonna be feasible. And so that means it can't find a solution. Now, if it would have ran longer, the primal objective would have just gotten bigger and bigger, would have went off to infinity. And so that means it just, it just can't find a function. And so this means that this point is allowed. And so this is good because it turns out that's what we expect, you know, say for that is um, now, now let's try the other point um, where we assume the gap is 15. Um, so here, uh, again, dual objective is zero. Primal objective starts at some big value. And as you see, the primal objective is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and so this means that it's getting closer and closer to being feasible, i.e. it's getting closer and closer to, saturate, to, to satisfying the constraints. And so once this objective value gets small enough, it get, once it becomes smaller than some user specified value, we, it, basically, we have decided that it's feasible. And the ten is still pretty big. You know? Yeah, it's pretty big, but it's like you know, if you're used to doing the bootstrap, you realize that like once it gets down to be ten to the ten, it's eventually going to go to zero. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is something. It's just gonna be something you have to have experience. But you said that uh, you put uh, error to be like ten to the minus five. Okay, so there's different errors. Yeah, so like yeah, so I mean, th th this is um, so like this is the value of the objective function, and then there's the value of the. Uh, feasibility, but then the, then SDPB also has an option where it's like, it can kind of predict that it will either become feasible or never become feasible without actually getting to that value. Um, and so, and so it just makes the program run faster. And so that's what's happened is that like, basically I've told SDPB that if the primal objective is getting smaller, once it's smaller than 10 to the 10, you should just say it's feasible. Now, if you really want to be careful, I could have set it to 10 to the minus 10. It would have just taken like maybe 20 more seconds to run. Uh, but you know, from experience, I can just tell you once it gets to this value, it's always just going to get small. Um, and so here we so say, you tell you the values of alpha, like the, the you, you, of you, the you, yeah, so you can extract the values of alpha. So like this gives an output file. Yes. Um, so now we can look at the output file if you want. So here's the output file. Here's the output file for 14. There's also an output file for 15, and this includes the value of the functional, which is this y. So as you see, it's just a list of numbers. Um, and so in the case where it couldn't find a functional, it's kind of a meaningless list. In the case where it could find the functional, you could say it's meaningful. But after all, finding the functional means that you you, you uh, contradict the crossing equations, which means that there's not a point. And so the functional, like, it's not that useful uh, in this specific case. Uh, but this but this is already interesting. Here we found that one assumption is true, the other assumption cannot be true. And so we've already found an upper bound. So the upper bound for the value of delta phi equals 0.52 must be between 1.4 and 1.5. Um, and so the, la so the last thing we demonstrate is, um, now we can do um, the OP coefficient algorithm. Um, and so for the OP coefficient algorithm, you have to use parameters that are slightly different. So notice the parameter file is a different name. Basically, you have to use slightly more precision. And also, in this case, we don't want to find feasibility because we want to get optimality. 
So you should turn off, so you should tell the program, don't stop when you find feasibility, keep going, and try to make it optimal. And in particular, optimality is determined by some user chosen threshold. And so basically, let's, like we decide the program will end once the objective primal is equal to the objective dual up to some error. And like how small that error is, is basically how accurate, you know, the program is finding your OP coverage. Now, the reason you don't want to make that error just infinitely small is that like, this is how small the error is from the SCPB perspective. But also it's like, you know, from the physical perspective, if you've only put in, you know, derivatives up to say, you know, six, then you don't expect it to be that constrained. And so like you expect that like, you know, even if the program ran forever, it would only get a bound, you know, of a certain accuracy. And so there's no point in making the program run, run longer than the amount of accuracy you anyways expect, you know, for up to six derivatives. And so that's why it's kind of an art of kind of just like, you know, choosing it such that like it has as much accuracy as you, ex as you expect, but no more. Because otherwise you're getting like a really accurate number of something which, you know, globally speaking is not accurate. Um, okay, so, so now let's run this algorithm. Um, and so this algorithm is gonna take longer because first, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna try to find feasibility. Um, and so notice here that unlike the scaling dimension algorithm, both the primal objective and the dual objective are both non-zero. So, so it's really doing a non-trivial thing with both the primal and dual problem. And so what it's doing is that first it's trying to find a feasible point. So you see that this primal objective value is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and assuming we haven't made any typos in our code, it better be at least feasible. You know, because the point is that this is supposed to be a point which is allowed, and not only is it allowed, but you can bound the OP coverage. If the point's not allowed, that means you were just silly and you put in the wrong parameters. So, so it, it better be at least feasible. And so it takes, you know, a number of steps uh, to, to even get to, get to feasibility. Because to get to feasibility, you want this primal objective and the dual objective to start kind of getting very close to each other. And so you see that the dual, prime, dual objective started some huge value. In the beginning, it was even going up. So you might have gotten nervous, but then eventually it starts going down. And so now these values are both going down, they're getting smaller and smaller. And so then there's like this gap value, which is kind of like saying, you know, what the gap will be. So it kind of starts at one, and once it gets below one, then it'll start changing. Um, okay, so the, the code kind of like chugs along happily. Um, and now you see both primal objective and dual objective are both getting very small. Uh, and so eventually they're gonna become the same number. And then once they become the same number, um, now this gap is telling you precisely how similar they are. So you see the difference between them is now very small. And so once it becomes 10 to the minus five, that's when you, the user said the code should stop. And so then this value, which is either the primal objective or the dual objective, but they're equivalent, you know, up to this tiny error, that is the bound on the OP coach. Because remember from the previous lecture, we said that the OP coefficient is always less than or equal to minus the functional acting on the unit operator. And so you multiply minus one times this negative number, and then this, and this positive number, the resulting positive number is the bound. So this is saying that the OP coefficient of the stress tensor is less than or equal to 1.06. And so, I mean, one last thing you can do, uh, remember from the previous lecture is that for conserved currents, there, you have these things called central charges, uh, which is the coefficient of the canonically normalized conserved current. And that's basically the inverse of the OP coefficient. So one over this is CT. So because this was an upper bound on the OP coefficient, it's a lower bound on the inverse of the OP coefficient, which is CT. So this is telling you that one over 1.06 is your lower bound on CT. So that's a number very slightly smaller than one, where we've normalized things such as the free theory would be one. So we're finding there's a bound slightly smaller than one. Um, okay, so I've demonstrated these algorithms um, specifically for um, uh, just like one specific value of delta phi. But, you know, as you saw, it only took like a couple seconds for the scaling dimension algorithm, and then it only took maybe like a minute for the OP coefficient algorithm. So this is something you could very feasibly do on your computer yourself, which you should do, uh, for many different values of delta phi, and you can thereby carve out an entire allowed region. Um, and so what I was demonstrating was for like lambda equals six, uh, to get slightly better bounds, I did lambda equals 11, and that's what's demonstrated in these plots. So this is a plot you can really create yourself. Um, and so, so let me explain this plot. So on the x-axis is delta phi. I'm calling phi sigma. So this is the lowest dimension z2 odd operator. This is the external operator dimension. So as you see, 0.52 is this value, but you could have also run it for other various values on the x-axis. The y-axis was the gap we were assuming in the spin zero sector. So like that was the, the bound we were assuming. Everything else was just unitary. And so remember that when we tested 1.5, that was disallowed. When we tested 1.4, that was allowed. And that's, that's what's reflected in this plot. The blue region is the allowed, the white region is the disallowed. Um, so the gray dotted line is the upper bound you would have gotten by running exactly the code I just showed you. So with derivatives up to six, 
The black line is once you in increase derivatives up to 11 just to get slightly better convergence. Um, as mentioned, convergence is monotonic. So the bounds always get better. And so like this is the sense in which the bootstrap is rigorous. Uh, so the bounds are always getting better. And so one thing you already find, which is very interesting, is that if you were to run these bounds for many different values of delta phi, you would find there's a kink right around the value of 0.52 and around 1.4. And it turns out that this red dot is what Lattice Monte Carlo had predicted many years ago for where the icing model should be. So this is one of the original nice results about the bootstrap, which you can now derive yourself after this class on your laptop. You can, you can make this entire plot in maybe 20 minutes. And you can find that there is a kink exactly where the icing model was predicted to be by Lattice Monte Carlo. And so remember, the input to the bootstrap assumed nothing about the icing model. This applied to literally any CFT. It's just a four-point function of identical operators. And so the fact that a known physical CFT existed in, you know, on this plot, I mean, it had to be somewhere in the allowed region, but there was no kind of like necessity that it had to be run in the boundary of the allowed region. I mean, that's very surprising. And in fact, not only is it on the boundary of the allowed region, it's actually at a kink on the boundary. And so, so this is why people first got excited about the bootstrap. Um, the fact that it lies right along the boundary. And so remember from the previous lecture that I said that without any- That means that even if you increase lambda, any part that the bound will not shift. Exactly, yeah, so that's a good point. So like, you can basically, like as you increase n max, it can't get better because otherwise you'd be excluding a known theory. Um, and so, I mean, this also demonstrates that this converges very quickly. You know, because you could create this, this bound, as I'm saying, literally in, in under an hour. And in under an hour, you can find the icing model. Uh, you know, whereas if you were doing Lattice Monte Carlo, you would have had to wait like weeks probably. Uh, anyway, um, so in the previous lecture, I discussed how without further assumptions, you only get upper bounds. I also discussed that you can do an assumption where you set the gap, say, to three instead of 1.4, and then you insert an operator below. And so the way that works, so just to show you very briefly, um, the input changes in a very minor way. So basically, instead of, um, you know, putting just this list of polynomial constraints, which is what this V was, um, you can have, in addition to this list of polynomial constraints, you can put one extra constraint, which is what I call insert operator. And so this is just a crossing function for spin zero at some specific value of, of delta, which is user specified. This is what's called delta insert. And so you would just have the same set of constraints, except now putting the, 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 the bound at three, inserting this operator below, and then you would change the value of the operator you're inserting. And that way you can get both an upper and lower bound. And then you would just run SVB exactly as before. So there's no reason for me to show you that again. And then if you do that, you get both an upper and lower bound. And that, that, that's what gives you these, this brown lower bound. So the, so, the, so the dotted brown lower bound is what you would have gotten with six derivatives. Once you go to 11 derivatives, it already drastically improves. And you can kind of guess that as you go to even higher derivatives, it's going to keep improving. And what's interesting is that now you find that the IC model not only is going to be at a kink, but it's going to be at kind of the point of a peninsula. And so you can see that it's like really kind of carving out the entire allowed region. It's including the free theory, which is over here. And then it's also, because we haven't excluded that with any assumptions. Um, and then also it's going to include the IC model. Um, and so clearly the IC model is going to be very special. And so, so far we've learned that with a single correlator, already you can get the IC model at the corner of a peninsula. We haven't gotten an island yet. For that, you'll have to wait till the next lecture. But already we found the IC model at the corner of a peninsula. So sorry, this soft blue is excluded or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the light blue is now it's excluded now that you also have this lower bound. So, so this is how, you, how you've improved it. And like this is basically with the assumption that the second lowest spin zero guy is at three or higher. And then you've inserted the lowest guy and you were varying it. And if you will vary this three, you will increase or it's not clear whether this region would be. Okay, so in principle, you could make the gap even higher than three and vary the thing below. But the problem that you could do that, it's just, but then you'd be making assumptions that aren't physically justified. Because like we know that the IC model, or by assumption, the IC model say has like two relevant operators, one Z2 even, one Z2 odd. So there should be one relevant sigma, one relevant epsilon. Um, relevant means operators of dimension three or lower. And that's why we put the gap at three, because I was physically motivated. You could put the gap at four, but then I, how do you know you're not excluding the IC model? Because like maybe the IC model is an operator at one and a half and also an operator at three and a half. I mean, a priori, that's not part of the definition of the IC model. So that's why we want to be conservative. And we only want to put the minimal number of assumptions, which is how many relevant operators. In principle, you could do that, yeah. So like, so like one way of checking if the next operator is that you could put the gap and then you could play this game. Um, it turns out that's not fully necessary. So, the, so, like, so one thing you can do, which I might discuss in the next lecture if there's time, is that once you find a functional, which is right at the boundary of the allowed region, so that functional is an approximate solution to cross. You know, because that functional is just all the numbers that are multiplying the blocks. 
And so you can think of those numbers as OP coefficients. And so that means you found an approximate solution to crossing. And so instead of having to run the bootstrap again and again and inserting all these gaps, you can just read off the spectrum of all operators that appears in that four point function. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so, this, so this is why the bootstrap is, you know, in principle, it's not just bounding one operator. Once you have found a point on the boundary of the alive region, say this red point, which you expect to correspond to physical CFT, you can then just look at the functional at that point and read off all the CFT data for every single operator. I mean, up to numerical precision. So of course, in practice, you know, like you can only look at the operators up to the spin max you specified. And also, if you're looking at, say, like the second or third lowest operator of a given spin, it might get less and less accurate because we know that in general, the tail of the distribution is getting very small. But I'm saying, but up to numerical inaccuracy, you can read off the entire spectrum by looking at a specific solution to cross, such as that red point. Um, okay. But what if yeah. I assume that, uh, what if I don't want to study I think I want to find new CFT? Sure. Yeah. So, so the point is that, like, you know, the original bound, which is an upper bound, didn't assume anything about the icing model. That applied to literally any CFT. So any CFT would have to be in this general allowed region. Yeah, but then you don't manage to find anything else. Well, okay. So with these minimal assumptions, you don't find anything else. But like, you know, in the next lecture, we'll discuss how you can also input global symmetries. You know, you can do correlation functions of multiple correlators. And then by including those extra ingredients, you can find theories other than the icing model. Well, for instance, now let me assume the delta epsilon prime is less than three. So I allow another relevant operator. Sure. You, you, yeah, operator. but the, but the, the, the log region is just going to get bigger. So, I mean, it's because, like, you know, with, without making any assumption, you see the allowed region is this entire thing. And then after making that assumption, it became smaller. Yeah. So, if you relax that assumption, it would just go somewhere between the brown and black. Yeah. So, I mean, to find other theories, you kind of have to, like, input more stuff, you know, because you're not always so lucky that the theory just exists right in the boundary. Is it also possible to reduce it to very, very small islands? Like, That's what we'll discuss in the next lecture. So, yeah. So, in this, so in this lecture, we don't have any islands. We just have a peninsula. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss how to get islands. Um, okay, so the other bound I wanted to show you was the OP coefficient bound. So remember, I said that here we were doing an upper bound on the OP coefficient of the stress tensor. That's the same thing as a lower bound on the inverse of the OP coefficient, which is what we call CT. So this is the central charge of the stress tensor, normalized by the free theory. So the free theory is CT equals one. Other theories will have different bounds. So here on the x-axis, as before, we have delta sigma. This was, you know, the delta phi we were varying. So we looked at a bound on 0.52. So that was the bound I showed you in the gray dotted line. If you did even more derivatives, you'd get the black line. And so if you do this for many different values of delta phi, um, so uh, what you'll find, interestingly, is that it turns out there's like a minimum of this bound. And that minimum is exactly where the IC model is. So this red vertical line is basically telling you the value of delta sigma of the IC model. Now, the reason why I don't write a dot is that Lattice Monte Carlo doesn't have an accurate estimation of CT with IC model. Because it's much harder for lattice people to estimate OP coefficients than it is for scaling dimensions. Now, this, this is already from a few years ago. So maybe by now they have some rough estimate. But at least when I wrote this, there was no such estimate. And so here, this was like basically the first prediction for CT for the IC model. So like no one had any prediction. And so this is basically suggesting that assuming the theory is saturating bound, which it seems likely from the previous plot, this means the value of CT for the IC model is around 0.95 where we've normalized things such as one is the free theory. So the IC model is very close to the free theory. Um, and this is perhaps not so surprising because after all, the value of delta sigma is you know, around you know, 0.518, and that's pretty close to 0.5, which is the free theory. But this is showing that it's close both in the sense of the scaling dimension as well as in the space of CT. Um, people have also computed CT using epsilon expansion. There's some papers by Igor Klebanov, and you can kind of show that it kind of roughly matches up with this predicted value. Um, and so this is a result of the OP coefficient algorithm. Um, where again, like this algorithm made no assumption. So this algorithm applies to any theory. And it turns out the IC model is a special point on this general bound that applies to any theory. Um, okay, so that concludes um, today's lecture, uh, just in time. Um, and in the next lecture, which is our second to last lecture, um, we are gonna discuss how to also do multiple correlation functions, not just correlation function of one identical operator. And we're also gonna discuss how to include global symmetries. So here we didn't assume any global symmetry, but you know, global symmetries are very important. Uh, and so, and then we're going to use those ingredients in order to get bounds also on ON, Wilson Fisher fixed points, as well as to get islands for the icing. Um, and then if we have remaining time, we might discuss a couple other bootstrap tricks. Um, okay, so um, any further questions about today's lecture?
Great. Okay, good. So, so I, I guess we can wrap up for today. Um, so yeah, so, so there, there, there's two lectures left. The next lecture is like, you know, uh, global symmetry and, and uh, islands. And the last lecture is going to be kind of like a general review of all the interesting results of, of bootstrap, in my opinion, up till now. Um, and so, so the last lecture, hopefully we'll have a, a bigger audience because you don't have to go to any of the previous lectures to enjoy the last one. Thank you, Shay. Whatever it writes. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Shay. Oh, this is one of the guys who came in person last time.